University of Wisconsin Medicine, Miami University, and Arizona State University, as well as at the universities in Europe, South America, and Asia as well. It is my privilege to invite our second speaker of the panel, Professor Abreden, to please share his ideas and his team, which is deals with the Gandhi's experiment with failure and reflect upon the moments of Gandhi's complex relationship with failure. Over to you, sir, please. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for, for being here. Thank you, the organizers, for, for putting this thing together. Uh, I'm thrilled and honored to, to take part in, in, um, in, this, in this project. Uh, first of all, I owe you all uh, an, uh, um, a disclaimer. I'm not a Gandhian specialist. I'm not, a, not even a scholar of India. I'm a primary, my focus is in philosophy, in Western philosophy. However, I, I've, came to, I've come to work on a project, a book project, it's called In Praise of Failure, where Gandhi plays a role. So for a while now, I've been working on, on, on his biography, on his work, and for that reason, actually, I came, over, I came to very close to your place. I spent one summer in Shimla, at the Indian, of, uh, uh, Indian Institute for Advanced Studies, and another summer in, at JNU. And that's, uh, that's where my, among other places, where my research has taken me. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm, I'm writing this book on, on, can you hear me all right? Good. Uh, on failure, in, pra in praise of failure, where the central notion is that <clears throat> the most important things in life is not success. Uh, it, there are other things more, more, more important, more worth pursuing, like self-knowledge, humility, knowing your place in the world, and so on. So the point I'm trying to make in the book is to dismantle, to dismantle, to and and, and reframe the, the dichotomy failure success. And to, you know, the best way, that's why, you know, the best way to learn more about failure and success is to look at, at, at great people, at some of the greatest people, like, just like, like Gandhi was in the 20th century. The book has, you know, the book is a philosophy book, makes a philosophical argument. At the same time, I knew five examples of, of real people, real great people, like Gandhi, St. Augustine, Nikio Mishima, and so on. And look closely at their biographies, at their work, at their thinking to make a sense, to make a sense of what failure, of how exactly failure works, how exactly people, people fail and how they succeed and so on. It's, of course, we have a tendency, it's almost a natural tendency to, 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 to admire great, greatness when we see it, to worship heroes and so on, even to you know, build statues. But you cannot learn much from a statue. You cannot have an intimate relationship with a statue. You cannot have a dialogue with a statue. Sometimes you have to get closer to, to get to know the people in, 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 in flesh and blood. So that's my, you'll see my, that's where my, my, my Gandhian uh, presentation comes in. It's, it's, it's a kind of a closer, more intimate engagement with, with Gandhi's, Gandhi's thinking and Gandhi's life and so on. I will, it's just what, what, I, what you're going to hear is just a sample. It, it's a much larger, it's a much larger uh, part of the book, uh, but you'll get a sample, a few minutes, uh, uh, some issues, some, some, uh, some, some, of the, um, some of the instances of, of Gandhi's encounter with failure. I'm going to, to present the text itself because it, it, it's already written. The book is, is going to come out next year. So I'm almost finished. And I'm going to give you actually a sample of the text. A slave dying, failure stared him in the face. For with slightly mocking eyes, a slippery manner and an unmistakable air of complicity, failure was there too, right behind his assassin. That's Ram Godse may have pulled the trigger, but it was failure that made it so easy for him to kill Gandhi. It was failure too that made Gandhi so vulnerable, turn him into such, a, into such an easy victim. And then was Godse did the killing, finished the Mahatma off. Indeed, once the bullet's job was done, <laughs> the more perceptive observer could have seen failure slowly kneeling, getting closer and shutting Gandhi's eyes perhaps even dropping a tear of compassion. And all that was done with much care and tenderness as befitting the solemnity of the moment. 
That's how Gandhi died on January 30th, 1948, by a fanatic's hand and in failure's shadow. But that's, that's also how Gandhi lived, in the dense shadow of failure. His, fi his final fatal encounter with it must have not surprised Gandhi. He must have been expecting, expecting it, however uneasily. If anything, he should have been surprised had failure not showed up on that day. Less than a year before, in April 1947, he had admittedly, con admitted candidly, I quote, no one, no one listens to me anymore. I am a small man. I'm crying in the wilderness, end of quote. For a man whose voice could, could once make everything in India stop on his track, such failure must have had a distinct irony about it. Indeed, what Gandhi had been experiencing lately was not just an instance of failure or another, but that kind of, that unique variety that thanks to its abundance and per per pervasiveness, eventually makes you feel of a piece with it. You reach a point where you no longer experience failure, but embody it. You've become failure yourself. While in Noakali in the summer of 19, 1947, trying to do something about the mass slaughter that had engulfed parts of the country, particularly the Punjab, Bihar, and Bengal, Ghani confessed to a clo close associate, the anthropologist Nirmal Kumar Bose. I quote, I don't want to die a failure, but as a successful man, but it may be, it may be that I am a failure. I am groping for light, but I am surrounded by darkness. End of quote. And things didn't get any clearer after that. On January 30th, 1948, literally hours before his assassination, Gandhi admitted to an American journalist, I quote, I can no longer live in darkness and madness. I cannot continue. End of quote. And for good reason. The India Gandhi had long envisioned was nowhere in sight. Even though the British had left, the dream of a great India had meanwhile turned into the nightmare of a country divided against itself, vivisected, Gandhi called it, partitioned into two, two new political entities and within each into myriads of smaller Indias, one angrier and unhappier than the next. This unleashed a mass violence of catastrophic proportions, resulting in millions of people dead or wounded and even more displaced. The word Holocaust would be employed more and more frequently in order to understand what happened in the aftermath of partition. For decades, Gandhi had tried to teach Indians the superiority of his brand of passive resistance, Satyagraha, truth or source or soul force, over the use of, of brute force. Now it looked as though all he had managed to do was stir up their interest in the latter. For a man who had made non-violence, Ahimsa, the centerpiece of his philosophy, public career and political program, first in South Africa and then in India, such an outcome could not have been but a resounding failure. The irony, the irony must not have been lost on Gandhi. One of his concerns early in his life had been that Indians lacked a fighting spirit Foreigners, Afghans, Mughals, British, could, could, rule, rule, Indi, could, sorry, could rule India for centuries for the simple reason that Indians allow them to. They are soft people, the complaint went. You cannot teach nonviolence to a man who cannot kill, Gandhi used to say. Now, now many of his fellow Indians seem determined to prove him wrong. Not only could they kill, but they did so with gusto. The countless uncollected corpses he could see all around him in the streets of Kolkata and elsewhere gave him empirical proof of that if proof were needed. True, India had won its much longed for independence. It was a free country as, at last. But it had, lo it, has, it had lost so much in the process that some Indians started to wonder if the price paid wasn't a bit too steep. For Gandhi personally, India's independence was not Swaraj, self rule as, as he understood it. He could see no role for himself within it. When on August 15th, 1947, India's political elites gathered in New Delhi to celebrate the event, Gandhi was conspicu conspicuously absent. He had little to celebrate. Just a few days before, on August 9th, an article in the Times of India offered a glimpse of the Mahatma on the brink of India's independence. It's a fine study in failure. I quote, Mr. Gandhi today is a very disappointed man indeed. He has lived to see his followers 
transgress his dearest doctrines, his countrymen had indulged in a bloody and inhuman fratricide war. Nonviolence, Cadi, and many other of his principles have been swept away by the swift current of politics. Disillusioned and disappointed, he is today perhaps the only, the only steadfast exponent of what is understood as Gandhism. End of quote. Sometimes Gandhi seemed as if he was not even that. At one point during the independence negotiations with, with the Viceroy in August 1946, an exasperated Gandhi reportedly slapped the table and thundered. I quote, if India wants her bloodshed, blood, sorry, her bloodbath, she, she will have it. Little did he know at the time how vast that, that bath would be and that he himself would be washed away by one of its tides. As the onslaught progressed, however, Gandhi received, received his signs. While, while visiting Amritsar, for example, he was startled to hear, go back Gandhi, instead of usually enthusiastic welcome. For the Muslims, he was a Hindu, which he was in, essentially was, for all his attempts at ecumenism. To some Hindus, he was a traitor. For most of India, during those bloody days, he was irrelevant. And he knew it. If India has no more use for nonviolence, can she have any for me? He started wondering. It turned out he was right. She didn't have much use of Gandhi. He had become expendable. More and more frequently now, in the months before January 48, mobs would shout openly, Gandhi for the house to Gandhi. Gandhi had for the or changes of disposition for their outbursts of love and hatred. He must have known then what Gandhi Mordahad, Mordabad, sorry, Mordabad really signified. It was now in shatters. All those being in vain, apparently. Rarely has his failure spoken more clearly in the midst of chaos and confusion. Ironically, judged by his own standards, Gandhi's life, while admir admirably well lived, seemed, seems badly spent. He didn't die in clashes with the police in South Africa, or while carrying the wounded during the World War, under fire and bombardment, as he sometimes was. He didn't die during any of his repeated imprisonments, or while trying to pacify angry crowds, or challenging them, as he often came to do late lately. He didn't even die of starvation much as he tried. He died the most ignoble, ignoble of deaths, a death as brutal as it was ordinary. Gandhi was killed swiftly and cowardly as an animal is done away with in the slaughterhouse. He certainly deserved a better death. Which may explain, which may explain failure's presence at the scene, scene of Gandhi's killing and the complicit gaze as he recorded it as it recorded his fall. There's another reason why failure was there near Gandhi on that January evening. They, failure and Gandhi, they had a close relationship, an absorbing relationship, which went back decades. If there was something Gandhi knew intimately, much better than he knew himself perhaps, it was failure. A guardian angel of sorts, failure had, had always been at his side. Whenever he had, he had some success, and, and the Mahatma was one of the most successful men of his time, failure would be there too, to push him down, to belittle him a bit, to hold him in derision. When he failed, and with, as with any great man, Gandhi's failures were great and many, his guardian angel was, there, was also there to do the opposite this time, to put him up and bring him back on his feet, to shame him in action, into action and self-reform. Eventually, failure made Gandhi who he was, just two years before his death, he admitted, I quote, it's plain to me that I am incorrigible, that I can learn only by, mistake, by my mistakes. I can learn only when I stumble and fall and feel the pain, end of quote. Gandhi was largely a self-taught man, and he could easily dispense himself of fancy schooling classes and professors. But if there is one teacher he could not do without, it was failure. That's precisely what makes Gandhi such a good study when one tries to understand the subtle workings of failure. In 1925, when he was in his mid-50s, Gandhi started pub publishing an account of his life so far. It was called an autobiography or the, tr the story of my, ex my experiments with truth. 
issued, issued in weekly installments with the original Gujarati published in his journal, Madhijan, and the English translation in, in, in one of his periodical, Young India. The, auto, the autobiography took some four years to come out in its entirety. When the English version reached South Africa, where Gandhi had spent most of his public career up to that point, a friend from Pretoria, who had known him well, had some difficulty recognizing Gandhi in, in, his, in this self-portrait. Self I wished, she wrote, she wrote him, I wished you had not given us that picture of yourself. The Mr. Gandhi I have now is much nicer. Perhaps Gandhi's South African correspondent may have stumbled upon one of his, one of the key features of the Gandhian approach to life, settled for nothing but failure. Success comes and goes, fa while failure, always loyal, never really leaves you. It can then be turned into a method of living. To live well, you need to posit, your, to posit yourself as a site of failure. You start from the worst person you could possibly be, and then gradually you build yourself up from there. According to, the, to this method, life acquires meaning only to the extent you can extract it from failure. From the stupidities you say, from the blunders you make, from the pitfalls, obstacles, and absurdities you encounter. The more you fail, the better your chance to find out your, what your worth is without, is. without failure, you wouldn't know. Such meaning is certainly slow in coming, painful to achieve, and never quite certain but it's the only meaning worth striving for. Gandhi's own struggle, struggle to find it, and to the end of his days, he was never quite, quite sure he did, is a dramatic illustration of the fact. The Gujarati word for auto, autobiography is Atman Atta, the story of a stone. That's precisely what Gandhi seeks to offer in his book, a detailed account of how his failed experiments with truth over many decades shaped his soul structure his self and eventually made him who he was. A crucial issue here is where does the journey start exactly? Not an easy question considering that each journey is highly individualized. You can't learn, you can't learn much from others. You have to discover everything on your own as you go. In its fundamentals, this is a journey that takes, takes place in, in radical solitude. For a clean start, Gandhi thinks we should we should descend to the lowest existential station we could possibly reach. And in doing so, he sets quite, high, quite a high standard. I quote from, from the autobiography, I quote, the seeker after truth should be humbler than the dust. The world crushes the dust under its feet, but the seeker after truth should be humble, should, should so humble himself that even the dust could crush him. Only then, and not until then, Will he have a glimpse of truth? End of quote. Now, becoming humbler than the dust, exceedingly difficult though it may be, is only a first step. The worst is yet to come. Since this journey is one of the most trying projects one can embark on, any account of it cannot be but a sad, heartbreaking affair, an oppressive tale of embarrassment and shame and guilt. Truth is what, with some luck, the traveler may arrive at one day the, loft, the loftiest of goals, but most of the time he remains steeped in, in, into its opposite, immersed in failure. In his book's introduction, Gandhi is quick to mention some, I quote, Himalayan blunders on his part, and promises not to, I quote, conceal or understate any ugly things that must be told. I hope to acquaint the reader fully with all my faults and errors, end of quote. And Gandhi delivers. Nothing, thin, nothing seems left untold in, in his book. Everything, even the most embarrassing, is properly confessed, described in painful detail, and repented for. As his friend from his days in South Africa and generations of biographers thereafter have noticed, in his autobiography, Gandhi is much harsher with himself than perhaps it should have been the case. Lest there be any ambiguity, various chapters, chapter headings make Gandhi's judgment of himself abundantly clear. A tragedy, that's the name of the chap two chapters in fact. He tells his meat-eating meat experiment. My father's death and my double shame connects, another chapter, connects Eros and Thanatos in a novel, guilt-centered and self-torturing fashion. 
a Himalayan miscalculation. You know, the chapter recalls the setback he experienced during one of his, one of his campaigns. Just as other people would, would brag about their accomplishments, the Gandhi of the autobiography seems almost to take pride in his various errors, shortcomings, and pitfalls. A proud, a proud collector of failures he, failures he was. In his own estimation, Gandhi was not much to talk about. Even as a child, he showed precocious signs of failure. It was, he writes, I quote, with some difficulty that I got through the multiplication tables. My intellect must have been sluggish and my, my memory raw, end of quote. For all his occasional scholastic promise, he, I quote again, he could only have been a mediocre student, end of quote. As a child, the future charm of crowds and, and breaker of empires was shy, constitutionally shy. He avoided all company, I quote, lest anyone should poke fun at me. And did I mention that he was a coward? According to the autobiography, he was an outstanding one. Before he made war against the British Empire, Gandhi had to deal with a different class of enemies. I quote another, from another place in autobiography, I used to be haunted by the fear of thieves, ghosts, and serpents. I did not dare to stir up, to stir up of doors at night. Darkness was a terror to me. It was almost impossible for me to sleep in the dark as I would imagine ghosts coming from one direction, thieves from another, and serpents from a third." End of quote. By all accounts, Gandhi underwent an important personal transformation in London, where he studied for three years to become a lawyer. But that didn't mean that, didn't mean that his relationship to fear changed significantly. If anything, the affair took new, more sophisticated turns. Upon his return to India, Gandhi embarked on a promising career as a briefless career, brief, briefless, brief barrister career, as he put it, first in Bombay and then in his native Rajkot. His first case in court stands out for his eloquent brevity. A defendant had engaged the West educated lawyer, freshly arrived from London, with a small, small causes court in Bombay. Gandhi showed up fancy lawyer's dress and all ready to make a splash. Then the moment came when he, when he had to cross-examine the plaintiff's witness. And I quote, I stood up, but my heart sank into my boots. My head was reeling and I felt as though the whole court was doing likewise. I could think of no question to ask. The judge must have laughed and the vacuous no doubt enjoyed the spectacle. But I was past seeing anything. I sat down and told the agent I could not, I could not conduct the case." End of quote. The Gandhi of the autobiography was an impatient, even abusive husband. It took him decades to reach a harmonious relationship with his wife, Karturba. Before that, however, one of Gandhi's recipes for solving marital, marital crisis involved kicking Kasturba out of their home. Gandhi may have been the father of India, metaphorically, but literally he was a rather poor father. I quote, I did not prove an ideal father, he writes euphemistically in, in the autobiography. The world looked up, of Gandhi, uh, up to Gandhi as its inspired teacher, and he, may have, and he may have taught it a thing or two. Yet, strangely enough, he failed to educate his own children, as he repeatedly, painfully admits in, in the book. I quote, it, it has been there as also my regret that I failed to ensure them, his children, to ensure them enough literary formal training, end of quote. He was not necessarily indifferent to his son's a formal education, but he, I quote, he certainly did not hesitate to sacrifice it for what he thought was higher ideal. I quote, my sons have therefore some reason for a grievance against me, end of quote. These are just a few examples. The autobiography's inventory of failures is as expansive as it is refined. Gandhi's could have easily called it the story of my experiment with failure. So much so that in an important sense, the book might, have, might be seen as part of a larger personal program to deal with failure. It's meant so much to give a faithful account of Gandhi's journey up to that point as to provide him with answers to some pressing issues. How not to let yourself crush by failure, how to make the most of it, Indeed, how to turn, to turn failing into an art of living. To make sure we don't lose sight of the bigger picture, Gandhi keeps reminding of it. Reminding of it. I, I quote, 
I have still to relate some of my failings during this meat-eating period and also previous to it, he writes at one point. Just as he notes elsewhere, the annoying persistence of failure. I quote, the unpleasant memory of past failure were yet with me, end of quote. There's no point in being in fleeing failure. It, it will eventually find you. Failure has the pervasiveness and insistence of water. Nothing is safe from its reach. No one will remain untouched by it. That's why Gandhi needed to write the auto autobiography to get used to staying wet. Indeed, Gandhi, the Gandhi we come across in the autobi autobiography is bathing in failure, swimming in it, sometimes coming close to drowning. The space between close to drowning and drowning itself, however, narrow as it may be, is more than enough if one is to use it, to use it properly, as Gandhi does. Coming close to drowning is a fundamental experience, as enriching and transforming as it's, it's life-threatening. As you are gasping for, for air, you find yourself in a situation where you can see and touch the limits of your earthly existence. You can feel it in your lungs. Yet sometimes, this experience is exactly what you need to wake up, religiously, morally, and existentially. Gandhi's experience with truth are failed experiments in good part, but that is precisely the point of his whole project. If you are to find your existential footing, you have to fail first, fail often and fail greatly. And if, if all that failing doesn't crush you, then you have a good chance at self-realization, which for Gandhi, was the only thing worth living for. Failure then is not to be passed over in silence, sugarcoated or otherwise intelligently dismissed, but faced for what it is, confronted in all its savagery. And for that to happen, you first need to acknowledge and take it in. Hence, the failure therapy he undertakes in the autobiography. The text, however, is no mere record of Gandhi's recollections of failure. The autobi autobiography performs something much more important. Just like St. Augustine's Confessions, Gandhi's book is performative, writing at its cruelest, writing as a hair shirt wearing and self-flagellation. No fault is too insignificant, no blunder inconsequential, no shame too embarrassing to confess. Gandhi uses the pen to act upon its, himself to shame and punish himself, to inflict pain upon himself, to turn himself into a penitent. He was one of those who believed in the healing powers of confession. He recommended it widely, expected it from others, and in, in the autobiography, he brought it to an art. Whether his faults were great or small, his blunders, Himalayan or otherwise, Gandhi's harshness with himself was for him a matter of method and principle. One may be forgiving, with others, but never with himself, with oneself. When you are in the business of reforming the world to stand a chance, you need yourself to the highest standards. I have, always, I have always held, he writes toward the end of his autobiography, that it's, it's only when one sees one's mistakes with a convex lens and does just the reverse in the case of others, that one is able to arrive at a, relative, a, just, at a just relative estimate of the two, end of quote. Indeed, when you proclaim to the world that your life is your message, you, you place yourself in the most uncomfortable of positions, complete, uncompromising, unconditional exposure. You lay yourself bare, your nakedness for all to judge, and you are stuck you have nowhere, nowhere else to go, for you've just, decide, you've, you've just denied yourself the right to a private life. If the message you send out is to make any sense to others, then you have to articulate it in its entirety. You have to deliver your whole self to them. To say that my life is my message is in fact to say that your life is no longer yours. And here's where the difficulties be begin. For my life is my message is an open perpetual invitation to others to watch and judge you as mercilessly as, may, as may, they may see fit. And you are no longer in control of the narrative. The Gandhi of the autobiography is consistently harsh with himself. But since he is doing the narrating, he has a certain measure of control. 
He can frame things in a certain way, direct the reader's gaze, distract her or keep her busy. There's no such thing as an innocent narrator. Yet the life that you narrate and the life that others see unfold independently of your telling are two different lives. The failure that you admit, however openly and contritely, and the failure that others find in you are distinct failures. In this respect, to his critics and even to his followers, Gandhi has proven to be the gift that keeps giving. There is, no, there is more failure and deeper failure in Gandhi than he himself was able to narrate and ready to admit. There is plenty to sample. And here I'm jump, jumping to my uh, conclusion. It's a very brief, uh, very brief comment. Gandhi's experiments with failure are just another expression of his lifelong effort to transcend himself. Yet, what's unique about Gandhi is not that he lived just to transcend himself. Many people do that. The calendars of all religions are replete with saints and martyrs and visionaries. Unlike others, however, Gandhi decided that he should take the whole world with him in, in this difficult project. He wanted the world, too, to transcend itself. Always Gandhi, the perfectionist, the overdoer. V. S. Naipaul, in a characteristically insightful essay, called him a failed reformist. But that may be the wrong way of reading the Gandhian project. Gandhi didn't simply want to reform the world. He wanted to remake it. He dreamed of another world altogether. Throughout his life, he sought an ontological transmutation of sorts to turn this world into the kingdom of God. And of course he failed, how could he not? Yet, when you fail like, like this, not on a purely personal plane, but as, you, but as you try to identify yourself with the failure of the whole world, with the sinners and the downtrodden and the untouchable, your failure is no longer yours, and indeed no longer a failure. You may have failed, but in the process, something extraordinary has happened, something which defies human judgment. With with characteristic insight, his friend Tagore, Tagore grasped Gandhi's predicament. I quote from, from Tagore, perhaps he will not succeed. Perhaps he will fail as the Buddha failed and as Christ failed to wean men from their iniquities. But he will always be remembered as one who made his life a lesson for all ages to come. This is perhaps one of those few instances where failure turns into its opposite. You've succeeded precisely because you failed. And to the extent Gandhi succeeded, as tragic heroes often do, in pushing the boundaries of the human condition and opening new vistas on what, onto what humanities can be. He was crushed in the process, as tragic heroes always are, but it was worth it. For he managed to point, point out to a better, richer version of ourselves, should we be given the chance. Gandhi was positively out of this world, and we, we will, probably, will probably fail to make any sense of him, should we judge him strictly by the petty standards generated by this world. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very much different and valuable talk, highlighting the importance of failure of Gandhiji in many ways. It has given a completely different perspective, completely dis uh, different perspective to understand Gandhiji and his struggle. Thank you, sir. Thank you for this very detailed and informative talk. Now, now I request to our convener of the session, Dr. Dias Negi, sir, to please carry forward the session. Hello, thank you, Dr. Naji. Professor Kostia, there is one comment, I will not say a question, which is uh, one Dr. Bist, Surendra Bist, has written, Gandhi, a great teacher, appears once in a while. Several centuries may pass by and without of such a one. First lives and then tells others how they may live likewise. Once Gandhi said, when violence appears to be only temporary, the evil it does is permanent. How do you uh, see to this statement, uh, Professor Kostika? Well, uh, it, it's 
always it's always coming from Ghana. It's uh, it's, yeah. it's 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 insightful. Uh, first of all, you need to place it in, in the context from from which it's taken. Uh, it looks good. It looks interesting. Uh, when violence appears to do good, is only temporary. The evil it does is permanent. That's uh, that's, that's pure Gandhi. <laughs> um, there is one more one more question from Mr. Sharma. Is trying to ask: uh, Did Gandhi glorify his failure? I don't think so. Um, if you glorify failure, you f you fail basically. I mean, the the point is not glorifying you because you you enter the same vein, the same dichotomy of failure, success, and uh, uh, glory, and so on. It's it's to to get closer to you, to to feel and understand its its inner inner workings. Uh, failure happens. We we are we are designed to fail. We we all fail. We will one day disappear, and that's a form of failure. Um, so there's no way of, of ignoring it. There's no way, no no point of um, trying to um, you know, pretend that we, 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 we do not fail. It's there all the time. It's with us. We are born to fail. Same time, the, 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 the lesson, the, um, as you know, okay. thinkers, philosophers, and as human beings, is to learn from it and, and to become a bit wiser, to, to, um, to use failure as a teacher, to turn failure into a teacher, you know, to get, become friends and, 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 and make, make the most of it. I would like to add one more point. As uh, you said very aptly that Gandhi did not glorify failures. Actually, in the beginning you said that was perfectly all right, that failure made what Gandhi was. So failure is a part of life. Once you fail, then you try to improve. So that's what Gandhi also did. His, whether mm -hmm. his experiment with truth or his, his, his Swaraj or everything, during the independence movement also, there were many episodes when Gandhi thought that uh, his motive is not succeeding and it was a kind of failure only. So he, he, he had to abruptly call off that, that satyagraha, that movement. So failure, I think, is a key to success also sometimes. When you fail, then you try to improve. So that's what Gandhi also did. So I, I fully agree with you that Gandhi never glorified his failure. But he always tried to learn more from the failure or the causes, uh, ca causes of the failure and then try to improve upon the ways and methods. Mm. But as you said that you are, not, uh, an, uh, you are not a specialist of Gandhian thought, but the way you spoke, you never give any impression that you are not a specialist. You well, that's a good very, way. Very a, well. That's one way to approach failure. <laughs> very well and it is also a Gandhian way that you Thank are you. accepting that, that you. you are not you are not an expert but then you are expert so the same thing Gandhi <laughs> also, also did and uh, he said that you learn from your failures so that's, that's why I think you you are also leading by example like Gandhi led by examples Gandhi Thank was you. exemplary because he practiced and then he preached one can only only preach when one practices. If you can only preach and you, if you don't practice, then I don't think people will take you very seriously. So that's why Gandhi was taken seriously because whatever he did, first he experimented and then he brought it to the knowledge of the people. So that way it was very, very interesting. And I would like to, uh, I would like to thank you for giving this uh, opportunity to all the participants and all the all the uh, all, all, and the organizers and even uh, even uh, Professor Michael also reminded us that other, uh, the month of August is so important for us, not only for our independence but but also for the start of the Put India movement. So that way, that way it is also very important for everyone to learn because the younger generation uh, must have forgotten that this why this month of August is so important for us. And they, they need to know about it. So I think this uh, this webinar is very important uh, 
uh, I can see that in the chat box, there are many things that Gandhi is relevant. Do you agree with this? Gandhi is always relevant. And as you, <laughs> all the speakers are saying that Gandhi is relevant. So what, what more they want to know? They have to, they have to read Gandhian thought. They have to read Gandhian different times. And then mm -hmm. they can say that, yes, Gandhi is still very, very relevant. And I think Professor Mir also wants to say something. Yes. I can, I can, I can. Uh, I would like to take the thread from what you said. And before complimenting the excellent speakers you have invited, and it was a learning experience for all of us. But at the same time, a very important issue has been raised, rather issues have been raised, especially by Professor Negi, and uh, the Gandhian thought and our present uh, scenario, what is going at present around the world, especially in our India. Very, very important issue raised by Professor Negi. Well, uh, Professor Negi and all the participants know it, that it took decades to Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi to float whatever ideals he cherished. And as Professor Madam Vice Chancellor rightly said, he lived by example. And he carried whatever he said, he did it and he did it by action. Well, Professor Negi, I am of the opinion, I am of the opinion whether one belongs to Gandhian philosophy or not, whether one adheres to Gandhian ideology or not, very shortly I must say, we are born as a human beings. And we get the tag as soon as we get birth in a particular family. The tag which is attached to us depends upon where I am born. I am born in Kashmir. I am a Kashmiri. Some of my friend is born in England. He is English. And similarly, one is born in a Muslim family, he is a Muslim. The another is born in a Christian family, he is a Christian or a Hindu or whatever it is. The fundamental ideology, if we can follow right from the very beginning, apart from our faith, we must adapt to our faith, whatever we have. If we can inject and inculcate, inculcate the human values, in our children, I am sure it may take a long journey, it may take a long time, but we can lead not only to the ideals of Mahatma Gandhi, the great soul, but also the ideals of the great prophets of the world. This is what I had to say. No doubt, we are addicted in greed. We are addicted in violence. We are confronted with many challenges where we now have the basic fundamental, this is mine, that is yours. This is mine, that is yours. If we can come out of it and believe in the brotherhood, universalhood, obviously we shall lead towards what Gandhi, after a great sacrifice to the self, to the family, has taught to the world at large. Thank you. Thank you.